Welcome to the Citizens Band Radio Hour. Thoughtful conversations that explore issues of media and journalism, democracy and citizenship. The Citizens Band Radio Hour is sponsored by the Center for Media and Citizenship at the University of Virginia. You can visit the center online at mediaandcitizenship.org. Here's your host, Coy Barefoot. We begin with Bill and Tholis. Bill is the director and the CEO of the Miller Center of Public Affairs at the University of Virginia. You can learn more online at their amazing and very deep website. It's millercenter.org. Bill, thank you so much for being here, sir. Great to be with you. And we're relaunching the website in the next few weeks. So it's going to be even splashier, more colorful, more interactive. We're really excited about that. That's great because there's so much there. I mean... It's uh, there's videos, there's podcasts, there's there's white papers, there's studies, there's it just doesn't end. There's so much on that website. That's so why, that's why it didn't launch two weeks ago when we hoped it would. We just <laughs> moving, moving it all to the new platform took longer than I think we'd hope. But we're really excited about the new product. That's great. Yeah. You know, I was thinking today as as I was swimming laps at AZAC downtown, I was thinking about this conversation we were going to have today, and what kept coming to my mind was. How do you make sense of the nonsensical? Because you see reporters like myself, it's like they're just chasing a mechanical rabbit around the track. They're just chasing the latest tweet. They're just chasing the latest ridiculous, obviously BS story, like, you know, a terrorist attack in Sweden, which didn't happen. But they spend all their time just sort of chasing this nonsense. And you sort of realize, well, wait a minute, that's not convincing anybody of anything because the right loves the fact that journalists are chasing after us. They, they don't care if there was if Trump was wrong about a terrorist. They just love that it upsets the left. They just love to see journalists just in, pulling their hair out saying, well, this didn't happen. This didn't happen. And they sit back and laugh like, yeah, that's, that's sort of funny. How do you make sense? What's the best way for a citizen, for a journalist, for a scholar like yourself to wrap our minds around the the nonsensical aspects of this presidency. Well, it's it has been fascinating, uh, exciting, uh, um, entertaining at times, also worrisome at times, truly worrisome. And I, I say that as somebody who served in Democratic administrations, but f- some friends on the right are really quite worried about a few things that are happening. We've tried to anchor our analysis of this uh, transition the first year in office in five dimensions of presidential power. And we gave each one a P to keep it easy. So there's personnel, process, priorities, politics, and uh, the power to persuade the five presidential powers. And uh, every president stumbles on each one of those five. Um, Sometimes presidents have had major disasters in their first year on one of those five. I think it is fair to say that the Trump administration is behind in almost all of the five, yet actually they have some real accomplishments in each of the five that I I think partly because their communication strategy, their power to persuade is one based on flooding the field with information and even chaotic information. It's kind of uh, easy to lose track of where they think they're making progress, uh, but also they're doing that to hide where they're not making progress, where they're behind. Yeah. Where are they behind the most, you think? Is it it process? Process. They are behind in personnel. Oh, yeah. They've got most of their cabinet named. Uh, They've got about half their cabinet confirmed. They have not named uh, any deputies. Or if they have, it's one or two. They haven't confirmed any deputies. Or below that, assistant secretaries of state, secretaries of defense, and Uh, Since many people listening to your show probably work in the university, um, the deputies and the assistants are kind of like the deans. They run, they actually run the federal government, okay? The president doesn't run the federal government. And you might not even know who their names are or who they are, but they're working their tail off. The the deputies really manage our federal government above the career civil servants. They haven't named any of them yet. So the thing that actually gives me the greatest worry is... 
They haven't filled those deputies' positions, and the deputies really manage the process. And if the deputies aren't managing the process, what that means is we've got a dozen or more cabinet agencies or things that kind of count like cabinet agencies, uh, like the U.N. ambassador and some administrations, it's a cabinet level and others it's not. The U.S. trade representative, some it is, some it's not. If the cabinet secretaries and their deputies are not managing those agencies, the agencies run by themselves. And that's okay at some level. They keep the lights on, but they're not coordinating with one another. That's why you really need a process. And if you don't have a national security advisor, you don't really have a national security council process. And that's what worries me. And when you and when we say process, the work's not being done. There's well, there's no vision. There's no meetings. There, it's just not happening. Right. So, for instance. We've seen references to one or two things happening in the world, a North Korean nuclear test, a, uh, you know, Russia buzzing uh, a U.S. ship off uh, off in the Black Sea, in the Black Sea, the Russian spy ship off the coast of Connecticut. OK, for each one of those things, the Defense Department actually does have a reaction. The State Department has a reaction. The CIA reads and interprets that and gives its analysis. The Coast Guard the National Security Agency, which is different than the National Security Council, National Security Agency is listening to foreign communications. Um, the FBI, the CIA, I mentioned the CIA, all of the different agencies in the National Security Council are watching these things. But they may not be talking to one another. And that conversation itself is not getting to the president so that when he gets on the phone with other NATO leaders or with the Russians, he is communicating the best intelligent analysis and advice of the U.S. government. So instead what happens is the president consults with his National Security Council staff, and they come up with an answer without a really well-coordinated response, which it, is what you want. So in a sense, they're doing it with one hand tied behind their back, or, yeah. or even worse, they're doing it blind. Yeah, um, uh, a dear colleague and friend of mine, a guy named Ben Wittes, had a line, which is... Um, you know, he's concerned, for instance, on some of the executive orders, and he says it's mendaciousness watered down or moderated by incompetence. And actually, if you're the, the idea is that if you're fearful of what the Trump administration is doing because they come out with uh, mendacious comments, you can worry a little less because they're actually incompetent in their ability to carry forward on it. And that's because there's no process in place. If you are a Trump supporter, then it should be worrisome to you because they have a vision that you share, but because the team is not communicating and coordinating, they can't follow through on it. So the work can't be done. Yeah. So to the left's delight, then, they, they would be interested to know that the Trump team, at this point at least, lacks the skilled process element that you do see, and we did see, among some of the world's most noted demagogues, and tyrants, Stalin, Hitler. I mean, these people, uh, they understood process. They knew how to really get stuff done with the mechanisms and the, uh, the operational power that is a government. You know, uh, Rudy Giuliani told us in uh, some of the early planning work that we did for the first year project, he told us the story of how Reagan fired the air traffic controllers which at the time had the left in uproar. It turns out that on critical public service activities, having federal employee unions strike in places that could cause public harm, I think is now received wisdom that that's not a good idea. And Reagan fired the air traffic controllers. They planned for three months, including working at all levels of the Justice Department, so that if someone sued in a federal district court, the local U.S. attorney, say in Charlottesville, the Western District of Virginia, or in Montana, the U.S. attorney was prepared to fight that out in court. Compare that with the Trump executive order on banning uh, immigrants from seven predominantly Muslim countries. A a uh, policy advisor in the White House was on the phone the night of with the U.S. attorney in the Southern District of New York explaining the argumentation that they should use should it come to court. And that U.S. attorney may or may not have followed because they only had one day's guidance from a relatively junior and new staffer at the White House. 
So on this issue, this is one that the left really was up in arms about. I think they had some comfort in the fact that they didn't have the ability to implement. Right. The place where neither the left nor right should have comfort is should there be a real national security crisis where someone attacks a vital interest of the United States? You want those processes in place. You want General Mattis and Rex Tillerson and the CIA director to give the best advice to the president in a nonpartisan way, which is what those agencies really know how to do. They have a political spin on it. Times there will be political calls that people on the left may or may not agree with. But you want the best advice coming forward in a, in a thoughtful, coherent way. And there's a real concern right now that that system doesn't exist. We saw some of that incompetence. I'm thinking of Katrina, right? And the reaction of the federal government under George W. Bush. It was a, it was a historic moment of pure incompetence. The people that should not have been caught unawares and caught blind were completely, they didn't know what to do. They just didn't know what to do. Or, or their staff knew what to do and they wouldn't let them do it. We don't know. But so th- we've been here before. And and is it just the Republicans? I mean, is it? Yeah, we've seen it. We've seen it in Democratic administrations as well. Um, two different Democratic examples. You talked about the Gulf. The Obama response to the BPU oil spill was similarly challenged to the Bush response. I mean, it wasn't quite the human lives on the line that happened with this, you know, Category 4 hurricane or whatever Katrina was. But it certainly affected a lot of people uh, in the Gulf. And it took days for the administration to figure out what the coordination was. That happened on the Ebola outbreak as well. There was a sort of slow-moving response. Eventually, HHS and Border Control and others figured out how to respond to Ebola. Couple that with the challenge of a president of the United States coming out with something that they want to see done as policy, proactive policy, not responding to a crisis, proactive policy where they haven't prepared the political system. One week in Bill Clinton's term, the president that I served and who I happen to think was an extremely good president, his priority, having run as a working class white um, uh, middle American candidate, his priority was, it's the economy, stupid. And his first week in office, he says, gays in the military is the priority. Now, an entirely uh, valuable, noteworthy, important policy. He laid no political groundwork. He didn't his run first, on that. Didn't yeah. run on it. His first press conference, he says, this is a priority. Takes, and they ate him alive for ate it. Ate him alive. Yeah. Ate, you know, his own government ate him alive. Okay, Democrats in Congress, we're all watching John McCain now. People forget Sam Nunn got up in arms against Bill Clinton about gays in the military. His own defense establishment wasn't ready for this. Right. And in the same way that Donald Trump's civil servants are not all that enthusiastic to implement some of the things he's talking about, Bill Clinton's military was not enthusiastic to implement gays in the military. He hadn't laid the groundwork. So we've seen these kinds of things before. What we're seeing with the Trump administration is sort of a first, a first take at a perfect storm of um, botching several different dimensions of yeah. presidential power. And to borrow, to, to use a metaphor here of flight, if I hear you right, the best kind of process in laying the ground, you want to think about, uh, you know, uh, some kind of military transport taking off that needs a really long runway. Yeah. Trump, Trump wants to use the helicopter. He just wants to take off from this spot straight up, no preparation, no groundwork, and if I hear you right, if you do it well, you get buy-in, you get expert advice. There's a there's a process. There's a long runway to get something off and the everybody, ground. Everybody, unfortunately, every president lives in the shadow of, of FDR's hundred days. Everybody wants to get everything done in the first hundred days. So Trump, in October, at a speech in Gettysburg, laid out ten different executive orders he was going to do in the first hundred days another seven things he was going to do by presidential power, and then 10 new pieces of legislation he was going to introduce. So he comes out of the gates. He has all these signing statements. Some he can implement. Some, it turns out, he can't really implement. Some it's unclear exactly what he's signed. He doesn't have the machinery in place to follow through on it. And now he's working with the Congress to try to also move legislation forward. He listed 10 things in October he wants to do. The Congress essentially said to him, Paul Ryan said, Let's focus on two. Let's focus first on tax reform coupled with the repeal and replace of Obamacare. 
And then if we can get that done, we can focus on a second combination of tax reform and the building of infrastructure, the thing that you want to do. And now it's unclear because of the slow-moving naming of the personnel, the slow-moving of pulling the process together. Can they come back to their true legislative priorities that they laid out? Can they get those done in the first year? And LBJ said, you only get one year. Because after the first year, the 435 members of the House and about usually 33 or so members of the Senate are all running for re-election. And they stop worrying about you, the president, and they start worrying about their own re-election. Yeah, and they yeah. become very, very uh, concerned about anything they vote for that could be held against them uh, when voters go to the polls. So they're not eager to vote on some really high-profile, possibly controversial year. thing. You get a year. Yeah. So we're running into the, the myth of Trump as as a uh, business genius, corporate manager, I've interviewed journalists who've been covering him for decades, and they said that's a complete myth. There's there's four bankruptcies for a reason, and he he is not the great manager that people think he is, that his supporters believe he was. I'm going to vote for this guy because he's big in business. He's going to get in there and run the government like a business. And what we're discovering is, no, no, you really need somebody who knows how to run government to run government. Well, you certainly do need that. It is possible for the president to be the communicator in chief, as long as they have somebody working for them that understands the machinery of 4 million employees, right? <laughs> Two and a half million <laughs> civilians, one and a half million men and women in uniform, including fighting some pretty hostile wars uh, or helping in the assistance of. We've mostly drawn down in both Afghanistan and Iraq, but there are live actions going on, including yeah, as we speak. today as yeah. we speak. You need to have somebody in place that knows and understands that management. So people are looking now within the inner circle, who is that? Reince Priebus has had some management experience in government, both at the state level and at the national level. But it's not really on the management of the federal bureaucracy. Mike Pence is the next candidate. Mike has been a governor, so he understands managing federal, he understands managing government uh, bureaucracies and government agencies. And he's been a member of Congress, so he understands the contours of the federal government, but he's never managed in the federal government. And when you look across the senior White House staff who have been named, so far, really, the only person is a deputy chief of staff named Joe Hagan, who served in that role in the Bush administration. He's the deputy chief of staff for White House operations. So he doesn't, his expertise is not pulling the levers of not power policy. Yeah. outside of right the 18 acres at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. It's um, that that's what he knows. Well, it's the broader machinery of the federal agencies. How do you get cabinet secretaries working together? What can you give each of them to do by themselves? Yeah. Somebody needs to understand All that stuff. Johnson that understood how to make things happen on the Hill. Yeah. Yeah. And, and working with the Hill is key. And what one's hope is that between Priebus and Pence um, and working with Paul Ryan, that they can, if if one is particularly a conservative and you want to move that side of the agenda, one is hoping that they can figure that out. And fr and frankly, for the good of the country, I hope they can figure some of that stuff out. Some of those things, if you're a progressive, say you care about climate change, you don't want them to figure right, that right. out, <laughs> right? You know, this is this is the Ben Wittes line of yeah. if you see them as mendacious, you're betting on their incompetence. If you see them as public servants protecting American interests. You're hoping they they root out that incompetence pretty quickly. And I think, you know, I, I think on much of the federal government, we better hope they get competence soon. We've only got a few minutes left, but I did want to give you an opportunity to share with us from your perspective, Bill, wh how do we need to be thinking about all this Russia stuff? Mm -hmm. how do, because the left is, is just uh, ablaze with conspiracy theories. I'm right in there with them about what are the connections between Trump and asking all the questions that, frankly, investigators on the Hill should be asking right mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. And and we both know that if the shoe was on the other party foot, Republicans would have already launched hearings. They would be screaming treason on every talk show mm -hmm. repeatedly. Um, but we don't see that from the left. We don't see the hearings. From your perspective... How should we be approaching this? How should we understand this? So let's start center out or maybe center right and then move toward the left. Center right, we should start with the policy. 
For me, the greatest concern about this, even setting aside what Russia did in our elections, which the intelligence communities and many, including Republicans, believe was trying to undermine our democratic system. Do we see Russia as a responsible stakeholder and partner in the international system? Um, And the flip side of that is, does the United States as a government across agencies view our democratic allies in Europe and elsewhere in the world as part of our definition of national interests. So the Trump slogan, uh, America first, are American interests defined by going it alone or working with our democratic partners? And how does Russia fit into that? And I think extending fairly far to the right on Capitol Hill in the Senate, there is a belief that American interests are served by our NATO alliance, our partnership with other democracies, and viewing Russia as a challenge and a threat to those things. And I do think that over time, they don't want to mess with the honeymoon um, to the extent that the honeymoon is either over or ending. um, They are likely to become more vocal. I think you're going to see that come forward. We even saw that this week with Vice President Pence, um, Defense Secretary Mattis in Europe, Trying to calm nerves in Europe. Trying to calm nerves and going back to the standing talking points of U.S. foreign policy. You're starting to see civil servants in the State Department and the CIA and the Pentagon. um, A lot of the leaking that's going on is to protect and preserve not just American interests narrowly defined, but that broader definition of interests that Russia is seen as challenging. Okay, so let's start with that. And I think keep an eye on that. Then the question is... um, What kind of interactions did the Trump campaign and then through the transition, Trump's advisors have with Russia when the stated policy of the United States and the sitting president of the United States was that Russia had intervened in our elections and that sanctions, um, not only did the sanctions exist that we needed to stick with, but enhanced sanctions as a result of and in response to that intervention. And were they trying to undermine standing U.S. policy before they took the oath of office? It appears to me, based on the leaks from the system, that um, that General Flynn was trying to undermine that policy and that he was then dishonest about it with Vice President Pence, who appears to be a believer in those standing policies and have his own concerns about Russia. Then the question is, what did Trump know and when did he know it? Was he aware of those conversations? Did he authorize those conversations? If he did, how far back was he authorizing those conversations prior to Election Day? If he was authorizing those conversations prior to Election Day and there was a pro quo for that quid, right, um, right. what did that mean and what does that mean? No one knows that. Now we're in the world of speculation. Then you get to motivation. Why would he do that? Um, Speculation not just on that, which we're speculating that he might have done something, but speculation on why he holds the Russian views about Russia that he does hold. What some senior Republicans have said to me is, um, at first they just thought it was a quirk of Donald Trump. There are a lot of business leaders in the world who actually really don't care much about democratic institutions. They're focused on their bottom line. I know many of them. And they think Putin was someone that they had to do business with. They had been able to work things out for Putin, sometimes in very above-the-board ways. And Trump might have been one of those people who had an affection and allegiance for Putin. Many of them are wondering, given everything that has happened before, why does Trump still stick with this view and this approach? Um, some view it as just stubbornness. He has a view and he's a stubborn guy and he's succeeded in life by being stubborn. Some people think, okay, maybe there is something deeper there. I personally don't know. I think we have to start again with policy, focus on Flynn, what happened there and why. Presumably there's a Senate intelligence investigation going on on that. And then how far did it reach back before election day and how far beyond Mr. Flynn and a few other campaign workers, does it go? Yeah. The fact that I wrote this on Facebook, I know I got to let you go, but really quick. I wrote this on Facebook last week. The fact that Trump reacted the way he reacted when he learned, along with us, we assume at the same time that, oh my gosh, I've got people on my team who've been in 
communication with Russian intelligence throughout the campaign, at least a year before the election. The fact that he didn't immediately say, this concerns me. I'm worried about this. I didn't know anything about this. I'm irate. How dare you jeopardize my campaign by doing something like that? I want an investigation. None of that. There was none of that. I think he it's... was being an apologist for it. Like, ah, oh, there's nothing to see here. We never would have known about Flynn if there hadn't been leaks. Trump wasn't going to tell us. Well, I, I don't say this as an apologist for Trump. I think the explanation that Trump would give is, I don't care about the conventions, okay? Um, there's the Constitution. I probably care about the Constitution. There's the law. I got a lot of lawyers. I'm not going to, I'm going to get lawyered up. I'm not going to break the law. Um. But the norms and practices of Washington, the worldview that Washington holds, I could care less about. And that, um, remember, John McCain had this uh, phrase of himself, the straight talk express. Yeah, yeah. It's even straighter than straight talk, right? It's, um, <laughs> it's an angry, aggressive, intentionally um, disruptive. A friend of mine, yeah. transgressive. A friend of mine has this great phrase about Trump. This is Pete Wayner, who is a conservative who worked in the George W. Bush White House. Um, people used to joke that Karl Rove was George Bush's brain in the White House. They joked that Peter Wayner was Karl Rove's brain. And Peter says of Trump in a very critical way, he has a transgressive personality. He likes to break conventions where he can break them and get away with them. And Russia strikes me as one of those where he just doesn't care that the fabric of U.S. foreign policy extending far to the right of the center of the political spectrum sees Russia as a threat, not as an ally. And he just has a different view of it. And he could care less what the rest of us think about. Yeah. That. Well, then Steve Bannon's in the right White House because <laughs> he's he's of the same mind. And the real question, even more transgressive, one of the real yeah. questions is, is Mike Pence in the right White House? And that's where I would keep the focus on the Russia stuff moving forward. Pence just finished a week in Europe where he essentially agreed with the Europeans that there's a world order based on liberal democracies and Russia is not part of it. Uh, where does this go? Where does that conversation and that relationship go? Yeah, yeah. Bill, thank you for being here. I know you're it's so busy. always great to be here. I cannot thank you enough for making time to stop by. And I know you have to run. Uh, let's do it again. Would look Love forward it. to it. Thank you very right. much. Bill Antholis is the director and the CEO of the Miller Center of Public Affairs at the University of Virginia. Check out the website. It's millercenter.org. We'll take a quick break. Lewis Wallace joins me on the program. He is a radio journalist and made some national news recently, and we're going to tell you why. Lewis, welcome to the program. I'm so glad you could make time for us. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. So you uh, were, were in the news. You're still in the news and making headlines, and, and not the kind of headlines that, that you would want to make. Uh, you were fired by American Public Media's Marketplace program. How long had you worked for them? And tell us what happened. I had been at Marketplace for about eight months, and I've been a, a radio journalist entirely in the public radio system for the last four and a half years, um, mostly reporting on economic issues. I spent several years in Ohio um, as an economics reporter for a small local station called WISO, and then I had moved to New York to work at Marketplace um, just last year. Uh, so. The reason I was fired, uh, it's a bit of a, a complicated story, but uh, not too complicated to get into. I wrote a piece a few days after 
Donald Trump's inauguration um, for my blog, which is on Medium, which is like a blogging platform. And I keep a blog there mostly writing about reflections from the field and kind of about journalism. So it's not really journalistic pieces. It's more of a, a personal blog, you know, about me as a journalist. And so I wrote a piece that uh, was entitled Objectivity is Dead and I'm Okay with It. And the idea behind the piece was kind of not a single thesis, but exploring a few different issues to do with the challenges that we're facing as journalists in an environment where there are people like Kellyanne Conway talking about alternative facts and then um, also dealing with a lot of news media that is not fact-based or that, that kind of thrives off of either spreading outright lies or um, or sort of in, implicit rumors like birtherism, um, which we know is a lie but has sort of gets talked about a lot in the media and spread around over the last few years. And, um, so, so how do the, the blog post was about how to address um, the post-fact kind of environment as well as attacks on the media itself and on free speech as journalists. And I was proposing an idea that's totally not new at all uh, of, of sort of um, doing away with the farce of sort of pure neutrality or pure objectivity and, and approaching our audiences with a bit more transparency about kind of who we are and where we're coming from. Um, and I talked about that a bit in context of my own experience as a transgender person and a journalist. And um, I was asked by my employer, or rather told by my employer, to take the blog post down um, because it was a, uh, they said, a violation of the organization's ethics policies. And um, I was suspended from being on air for a couple of days. Initially, I took the post down, and then I had kind of a very personal uh, process of reflection that, that led to the decision to put the piece back up on my personal blog. And before I did that, I, I let my employer know of my intention and, and why and that I disagreed with them on the idea that the post was a violation of our ethics policies. Um, a couple of days later, I was fired from my job. So that's the story. It's it's really a fascinating story because you weren't putting up a blog post to champion what's been called advocacy journalism. And yet your employers, that's what they saw it as. Well, you're just, uh, you know, Louis, you're in the wrong place. You need to go over there and do your advocacy journalism. That's not what we do here. And, you know, I can just imagine your frustration. No, no, that's that's not what I was saying at all. But... Uh, for their own narrative and their purposes of, you know, lining up all the ducks to fire you, that was that was their story. Well, you know, he just wants to do adv- advocacy journalism, and and we're real journalists. We don't do that kind of thing. Yeah, and that was a really interesting dynamic because, of course, I wasn't fired over any of the actual journalism that I'd done um, for Marketplace, and I had a very good track record there. You know, I really liked the work I was doing, the show. Producers really liked the work I was doing. I hadn't been criticized for sort of bias of any kind or or had really any issues on on the side of the actual work I was doing. And and I I believe that the work I was doing was actually a reflection of the exact thing that I was talking about, of sort of like it was shaped by my personal perspective and what questions I chose to ask and my approach and just kind of who I am as a person. Uh, And I feel very aware of that because of moving through the world in my specific sort of social identity. I'm always thinking about who I am and what I bring to the table and how that influences what questions I ask and even what stories I pitch. And, of course, that's happening all the time in every newsroom, you know, that that personal experiences are shaping are shaping our stories. And so, yeah, my interest was more in kind of exploring how to be more transparent about that um, and not necessarily in some sort of idea that every piece that we do should express an opinion on the desired outcome of a policy or of an election or anything like that. And I actually don't, um, I don't believe in or, or want to do kind of uh, partisan journalism, you know, aligning with a political party. Um, that's, that's really 
on a more personal side, not who I am, but also from the media perspective, um, I, I, I do think there was a, a gap between how what I said was perceived and um, what I really meant by it and what sorts of questions I was trying to raise. And I think lots of other journalists are asking these same sort of questions right now, you know, especially as everything becomes more and more driven by news that's on the Internet. And one of the main currencies of the Internet is kind of uh, identity and transparency. Um, that transparency can be the thing that leads to credibility in sort of Internet news in a way that is uh, very, very different than a newspaper or a radio show. It's interesting to point out that um, that that word transparency has always unnerved a journalist and, and broadcasters in particular. And I'm, I'm reminded of, you know, back in the late 70s when Ted Turner would go around to cocktail parties in Atlanta and say, hey, I have this idea for this 24-hour news network. And one of, the, one of the very principles that motivated him was to bring transparency to television news. He said, news is going on all the time. You just set the camera up and let it roll. And, and he was objecting to the fact that news was such a show. It, it was this show that happened at 6 o'clock and 10 or 11 and, and then went away. Um, and he didn't want it to be a show. He just wanted people to be able to see the raw footage and news as it's happening. And that gave us that a whole idea of more transparency in television news is what gave us CNN. It arguably gave us a 24-7 news cycle. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's really, really interesting. And I think... Um... I, I, I do see the struggle. Like, I, I definitely see and I understand the tension between sort of some of these traditional ideas, especially of a news organization who's um, like NPR or American Public Media, where I work, who sort of lifeblood is political nonpartisanship. You know, that's very, very important to those organizations, and I completely understand that. Um, but that is, in some ways, that it rubs up against this other thing of sort of people, you know, can go to the Internet and they can sort of find anything from any perspective that they choose. Right, and there's right. more of a hunger for sort of perspective-driven uh, work, which, again, isn't necessarily like leftist or right-wing or exactly. doesn't have to be, but, but more um, driven by personal perspective. And, um, and that was sort of the idea of, of, like, having a blog as a journalist, right, is people who are interested in me could or in my work, could go and, like, find out a little bit more about how I think. And so, but I think a lot of organizations are trying to figure out where that line is and how much do they yeah. need to change to adapt to the times. And, of course, I think they need to change a lot. But. Right, right, yeah, yeah. No, I, and I agree with you. And I think the the whole sort of what to me is an antiquated notion, you know, it's a, it's a late 19th century, early 20th century of uh, notion of objectivity it was originally a, a marketing idea. It was, you know, hey, we're going to sell mm-hmm. more newspapers if people think we're objective. It's, it's part, I would argue, that the very idea of objectivity is part of the show. It's more marketing than anything else because, of course, it doesn't – it literally doesn't exist because the moment that a journalist says this is news and that isn't, you've already been Unobjective. You've already decided that based on your personal experience and, and how you read the world and, and decisions being made in your newsroom, sometimes business motivated decisions, you've decided that's news, we're going to cover it, and that over there is not, and we'll say no to the press release. So th- that's, that's not objective uh, right out of the gate. But, uh, but I could see your push for transparency um, would would sort of rock them a little bit. You know, I read an article just the other day at Slate Magazine where the uh, where the the writer said that your very identity as a as a transgender man w- had become a liability for marketplace for American public media. Do you agree with that read on the on the connection to identity politics that they just saw it as we can't have a reporter who's transgender? as much as we might support that, but it, it's, it's a very violation of our definition of what journalism is. Uh, what was your, is, that, is that a correct read on that? Do you agree with any of that? Well, yeah, that's, I mean, that's a great question. I feel like the way that I think about that is, is almost sort of the, the inverse thought, right, is that, like, because I'm a transgender person, I have sort of always been acutely aware of how we bring our own biases to 
journalism because before I became a journalist, um, I mean, journalists and in particular the mainstream media are sort of seen by a lot of people in transgender communities as like bad guys because we've gotten so much terrible coverage and the way that we have been talked about has been so disrespectful and um, for for so long um, and been, you know, largely reflective of kind of media bias against transgender people, you know, not taking trans people seriously, not respecting names, pronouns, you know, um, kind of basic rights. And that has shifted only in very, very recent years um, because of a lot of advocacy. And so, you know, I sort of come to media, uh, media work from this, like, outsider place of, of feeling like the emperor has no clothes. And, you know, I can tell and have always been able to tell that um, even the quote unquote liberal media or the left wing media, you know, has not been great on these issues without being pushed on them. Um, and, and for me, my life and my sort of success as just a, a human being is pretty intertwined with doing that, that pushing. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't really have a career if I hadn't also been an advocate for myself as a trans person, and so those things are inseparable. Um, and so I think what I see coming from that place is kind of the privilege that it is to not see your own identity as politicized. Um, and and I think that it would be helpful if more people who, um, who have privilege and, and who maybe haven't thought about their own identity, say, as a white person or, you know, as a man or, or something like that, um, for, for more journalists in those positions to think about how their identities shape, what questions they ask and don't ask, and what stories they pitch and don't pitch, and um, how they talk to people, and that, that all of us have the ability to do great journalism. That's not an identity-based thing, nor should it be, but uh, a situation where you don't have a lot of diversity in the newsroom leads to its own sort of bias. Yeah, yeah. Um, I came to journalism from anthropology. So the the conversation that and the point you're making, I deeply appreciate because nearly three decades ago when I'm sitting in graduate seminars, we're talking about our identity as white Western people going into native uh, indigenous communities and uh, and, mm -hmm. and looking for all the metrics and the and the uh, the tropes and the things that that we want to talk about, you know, and uh, and so it it really it really makes you think. And for me personally, that there was no better training uh, than than anthropology f to do journalism, to uh, to do journalism and history, um, because you really get a keen sense of story, but also identity and uh, and and the relationship between them. And I tell you this: when I read your blog post originally, when this was first hitting uh, you know the airways and was first making news i really saw that that comment from christian amanpour from cnn that journalists should be truthful but not neutral that's what that's mm -hmm. the point that i saw you making that we have an absolute professional responsibility if we truly consider ourselves journalists to be truthful and to never 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 knowingly be untruthful and we are the first ones to correct ourselves. Um, yeah. But we also have a professional responsibility not to be neutral. Mm. And, and we have to use the power of the press to defend the ideals that we like to believe we stand for. Democracy, human and civil rights, equal justice under the law, uh, economic fairness. These are the things that we stand for. And these are the things that journalism is supposed to stand for. So we're not supposed to be neutral when it comes to speaking up for the ideals that America likes to believe that it that it stands for, uh, and that's our responsibility. Yeah, I, I agree completely with that, and I think we're in an age where that is really being put to the test. You know, and part of that has to do with sort of the digital media and the propagation of the stuff I was talking about earlier. You know, fake news, and I'm putting fake news in air quotes as we do now, right, um, right, right. <laughs> but, you know, but, but then also these sort of open um, attacks from the administration, uh, the, the current administration on the media as sort of the enemy of, of the government, and, you know, so I, I think 
our values, what we do stand for, are being put to the test and are going to be put even more to the test. And um, I'm nervous about that. I want journalism to be really brave in the face of that and, you know, um, not back down and not normalize things that are uh, hateful and, and damaging to human rights. And I just think that's a very tall order if we're not also kind of looking at and analyzing ourselves in this moment. Yeah, yeah, I, and I absolutely agree. So I know journalists like true writers uh, never like to be the, the story. They they always are trying to get out yeah. of the way of the story. And here you are, <laughs> in a you know, making national news as the story. And, and your firing has really raised a lot of powerful questions about journalism in uh, in America in the 21st century and um what has the what has the story about you what has it gotten wrong is, is there any moment where you've looked at the coverage of your own story as a journalist and said oh no 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 that's not right that's not right or or has it really have people really been doing a good job <laughs> Um, largely I would say people have been doing a good job. Um, I'll tell you one thing is that, uh, so I use, um, he and him pronouns or, or, um, they or Z, you know, gender neutral pronouns. And, um, I identify as transgender. A couple of articles and pieces about me have identified me as a transgender man, um, which isn't actually how I identify. And it was sort of a, um, an, an assumption uh, uh, where folks didn't necessarily ask, and so um, that's been the only thing, actually. But but that's something I would say relates to what I was talking about a couple minutes ago about coverage of trans people. You know, there hasn't been a lot, and people aren't necessarily non-trans people aren't necessarily accustomed to um, interviewing trans people, and um, maybe don't realize that for the most part, it actually would be like a totally fine respectful question just to ask, you know, how, how do you identify or how would you like to be identified or something like that. So I think people are nervous to ask that question and then they don't ask and then can end up sort of guessing and, um, and getting it wrong. I am so uh, glad you corrected (laughs) me because I began our conversation today by referring to you as a, as a transgender man and that, and I, I apologize for that. And I'm so glad that you, that, that, uh, that that was corrected because, um, uh, now I know. And I didn't before. Yeah, and it's like, to- I, I haven't even um, corrected the uh, articles that, that came out that said that, because it, honestly, that for me is not a particularly big deal. Like, right, right. if I were called by the wrong pronouns or um, something else that I felt really uncomfortable with, it would be something different. But for me, it's sort of water under the bridge. Gender is very fluid in my life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and that, you know, that's just me, but... Um, but yeah, it's always good to, to have that conversation. I and I think, you know, just to pull the camera way back here and look at sort of the forest for the trees, I think, you know, we um, all journalists are students of journalism. So and we're fascinated by journalism <laughs> as, we're, mm-hmm. as we're in the process of doing it. And, uh, and, and if, if there's one key takeaway from the history of journalism and of news, we know for a fact that it's always changing. It's it's mm-hmm. always changing. It, there's no stasis at all, and it's not always changing because of technology. Certainly, that changes it. But it's also the people who are doing it and the circumstances under which they are doing it, both technologically and and culturally. And so we can say that the kind of journalism that's happening now in 2017 isn't necessarily the exact kind of journalism we're going to see in in 2037 or 2077. Uh, it's always been changing. It's always been adapting, morphing, and uh, and I think I I join you in the hope that we will see more of a widespread embrace of the idea that professional journalism should be truthful and not neutral and not hide behind a false sense of objectivity, which you and I both know is often there for business purposes. You know, not to alienate yeah. certain. Economic and, opportunities. Know, I, I agree with you about the sort of the history that there's this marketing tactic of that emerged at you know at the end of the 19th century and early 20th century of sort of oh we could sell papers we could sell penny papers to everybody instead of only to people who are with this one political party or other political party and you know that wide distribution to sort of was accomplished through nonpartisanship and that was part of the development of 
this idea of objectivity in journalism and um and that that remains as kind of one of the tenets for like marketability for some organizations. One thing that I think is just needs to be interrogated more is is the reality that um people perceive like broadly perceive journalists and journalism as biased and um not trustworthy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so a question that I have about that is like is it working? Is this idea that of sort of propagating the idea that we're objective and we're non-biased is that actually right. having the desired <laughs> right. effect? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, um, and it's like they don't even or stop would it to... maybe actually be a good marketing tactic to to um not say that to people because they don't believe us, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. They're looking at us and going, uh, come on. <laughs> And then activity yeah. doesn't exist. <laughs> and then you have people like you have people like the president of the United States who would like for you to just get your news from him, <laughs> you know, and, right. and 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 nobody else. He'll just tell you what's going on, and that's the, you know the very the very hallmark of a of a of a tyrannical society that your leader will tell you what what the truth is. And I'm just curious. We just have a couple of minutes left, but what's been your reaction to that to the Trump presidency vis a vis We've never had a president, perhaps since Nixon, that was this obsessed and not in a healthy way with the very idea of journalism. And that he doesn't just attack journalism. He doesn't just attack journalists by name. He attacks the very idea of truth itself. Yeah, I mean, obviously I find some of those statements um, on their on their face uh, – Concerning, and I also think that uh, his way of speaking has it puts journalists in a um, difficult situation. Often, in terms of sort of chasing his words, trying to cover just what he said becomes this like constant daily chase that that takes away time from doing more investigative work. Um, all of that said, I feel like I'm less concerned in a lot of ways about sort of what he says and um, then the policies that follow and and what sort of actual institutional support is behind that. And some of that with free speech right now is a wait and see. Um, some of it is not. I mean, I think we've already seen some curtailing of free, free movement of information um, out of government agencies and into the hands of journalists, and that that is something to be very, very concerned about. Yeah. Lewis, how can people uh, learn more about you, uh, read your blog, find out uh, what comes next for you, and uh, how can they reach you? Sure. I'm uh, on Twitter, at Lewis Pants, and my blog, which tells this whole story about my firing and has the original piece that I wrote, is on uh, medium.com, at Lewis Pants. And I hope that you have Pants landed like the clothes, Lewis with a W in the middle. And I hope you have landed on your feet and that you're still able to do the great work that you were doing for Marketplace. No, I'm definitely going to continue to be a journalist and I'm um, really, really amped up about it. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff. Lewis, thank you for your time. Thank you so much for, for sharing your story with us. And I'm, I'm so glad we could do this. I really do appreciate it. Thank you. Great talking to you. Take care. You've been listening to the Citizens Band Radio Hour, a production of the Center for Media and Citizenship at the University of Virginia. Archived podcasts are available online at mediaandcitizenship.org. The executive producers for the program are Siva Vadianathan and Koi Barefoot.